Welcome to Daily Scripture and Meditation with Shirley Celis Jackson. We begin as always in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Saturday, the 23rd of October, 2021, of the 29th week in Ordinary Time, is the optional memorial of St. John of Capistrano. Laudate, our daily prayer. Lord Jesus, increase my hunger for you that I may grow in righteousness and holiness. May I not squander the grace of the present moment to say yes to you and to your will and plan for my life. Amen. Magnificat Daily Scripture But first, an overview on the optional memorial. Proficient in civil and ecclesiastical law at the age of 29, John was named governor in Perugia, Italy. While attempting to broker peace in a regional war, he was captured and imprisoned. St. Francis came to him in a dream, and upon his release he embraced radical poverty as a Franciscan. He studied the preaching art under St. Bernardine of Siena. After one sermon, one hundred of his listeners applied to the Franciscans. In his role of papal diplomat, John worked for the unity of East and West at the Council of Florence. He died in 1456 after inspiring and leading soldiers in a battle defending Belgrade against the Turks. The Spirit of the One who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans, chapter 8, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has freed you from the law of sin and death. For what the law, weakened by the flesh, was powerless to do, this God has done by sending his only Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for the sake of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the righteous decree of the law might be fulfilled in us, who live not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh are concerned with the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit with the things of the Spirit. The concern of the flesh is death, but the concern of the Spirit is life and peace. For the concern of the flesh is hostility toward God. It does not submit to the law of God, nor can it. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. On the contrary, you are in the Spirit if only the Spirit of God dwells in you. Whoever does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. If the Spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through His Spirit that dwells in you. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 24 Lord, this is the people that longs to see your face. The Lord's are the earth and its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who can ascend to the mountain of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He whose hands are sinless, whose heart is clean, who desires not what is vain. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord, a reward from God his Savior. Such is the race that seeks for him. 
that seeks the face of the God of Jacob. Lord, this is the people that longs to see your face. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked man, says the Lord, but rather in his conversion that he may live. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. For if you do not repent, you will all perish as they did. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke, chapter 13, verse 1. Some people told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with the blood of their sacrifices. He said to them in reply, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way they were greater sinners than all other Galileans? By no means. But I tell you, if you do not repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those eighteen people who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than everyone else who lived in Jerusalem? By no means. But I tell you, if you do not repent, you will all perish as they did. And he told them this parable. There once was a person who had a fig tree planted in his orchard, and when he came in search of fruit on it but found none, he said to the gardener, For three years now I have come in search of fruit on this fig tree but have found none. So cut it down. Why should it exhaust the soil? He said to him in reply, Sir, leave it for this year also, and I shall cultivate the ground around it and fertilize it. It may bear fruit in the future. If not, you can cut it down. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Magnificat Meditation of the Day, entitled, Cultivated by Grace. Holy fear, which is the beginning of wisdom, will also be the beginning of of true humility, for as the inspired word says, humility and wisdom are inseparable companions. Where humility is, there also is wisdom. Proverbs 11.2 There is no saint, however holy and innocent, who may not truly consider himself the greatest sinner in the world. It is enough that he knows himself to be man to recognize that he is liable to commit all the evils of which man is capable. And if I do not commit them, it is through a special grace of God which preserves and restrains me. A tree does not fall while bending under its own weight, and this must be attributed to the strength of its support. And in the same way, if I have not fallen into every kind of iniquity, it must not be attributed to my own inherent virtue, but only to divine grace, which by its goodness has supported me. Therefore, how can I regard myself more than another man while we are all equal in human weakness? For what is my strength? Job 6, 11. I am a son of Adam like every other man. It would be well to say, O oh God, I can do all things if I am strengthened by your help, but without it I can do nothing, nor will I ever be able to do anything. As St. Augustine instructs me, whether it be little or whether it be great, it cannot be done without him. This meditation was written by Father Cachetan Mary da Bergamo, who died in 1753 and was an Italian Capuchin priest and a spiritual writer.
Laudate, Reflections and Actionable Challenges from Our Scriptural Readings Introductory Prayer Lord, who am I that you spend time listening to me in my prayer? Who am I that you speak with me? You have given humanity such dignity by assuming our nature and giving me personally so many gifts. Time and time again you have been patient with me and received me back into your embrace when I have strayed from you. Thank you for your kindness to me. I hope to receive it always in the future and especially at the hour of my death. Your kindness and patience are a manifestation of your love for me. I want to return that love because the only fitting response to love is love. Amen. Our petition for the next three challenges. Lord, help me to be as patient with others as you are with me. Our first challenge the figless fig. The owner of a fig tree in the parable, which many spiritual authors see as an image of God the Father, comes for three years in search of fruit. How often our Heavenly Father comes in search of fruit on the fig tree in our lives. And what does He find? He has given us the soil and so many elements that are conducive to being fruitful. He has made known His desire for us to bear fruit, and His Son has explained to us how the fruit is to be produced. There are no excuses. Let's take notice of the lesson of the parable. When the Father comes to us looking for fruits, it is because it is the time for fruit. What will we say to the Father if He has given us ten, twenty, forty, sixty years to bear fruit, but finds none? It's not just about looking nice as a fig does. It's about bearing fruit. Fruit that will last according to the Father's plan. Our second challenge, the fig that was almost toast. There was an American idiom referring to something that is destroyed and is no longer what it was. It's toast. The fig tree in the parable was in danger of becoming toast. Cut it down was the order given by the owner. Why should it exhaust the soil? What a terrible accusation! It was useless and only sapping nutrients from the soil for no purpose. When we apply this parable to our own lives, it is ghastly to think that our life or the lives of others might be just as useless. Cut it down. Take it away. It serves no purpose. The judgment is just. But it was a judgment that was soon to be lifted, both in the case of the fig tree and in the application to our own lives. Am I sufficiently grateful for God's continual mercy towards me and others? Our third challenge, leave it. Thanks to the gardener in the parable, the fig lives and is not cut down. The axe does not bite into the trunk of the fig, wrenching from it the beauty of its leaves and meandering branches. In our case, Jesus Christ, the good gardener, steps in and asks the owner, the Heavenly Father, to leave it. He, the good gardener, will take care of things, and how he does it. The gardener himself is cut down in a bloody way and crucified. We, who indeed should justly be cut down, are saved. While the axe is put to the trunk 
of his body all for love of us Archbishop Louis Martinez has a beautiful image in his book The Secrets of the Interior Life where he speaks of suffering as a manifestation of love it is said that the myrrh tree allows its perfume to escape only when it is bruised the perfume flows drop by drop through the lacerations of the bark that enfolds them our conversation with Christ Lord Jesus Christ how patient the father is with me thank you for coming to save me for laying your life down for me for suffering what I should endure because of my self-centeredness and sinfulness but with you there is hope our resolution I will exercise patience today with everyone I meet thinking of the patience that God has had with me meditation what can a calamity such as a political bloodbath or a natural disaster teach us about God's kingdom and the consequences of wrongdoing and turning away from God Jesus used two such occasions to address the issue of sin or wrongdoing and judgment with his Jewish audience. Pilate, who was the Roman governor of Jerusalem at the time, ordered his troops to slaughter a group of Galileans who had come up to Jerusalem to offer sacrifice in the temple. We do not know what these Galileans did to incite Pilate's wrath nor why Pilate chose to attack them in the holiest of places for the Jews in their temple at Jerusalem. For the Jews, this was political barbarity and sacrilege at its worst. The second incident which Jesus addressed was a natural disaster, a tower in Jerusalem which unexpectedly collapsed killing 18 people. The Jews often associated such calamities and disasters as a consequence of sin, doing what is wrong and contrary to God's law. Scripture does warn that sin can result in calamity, though the righteous fall seven times and rise again, the wicked are overthrown by calamity. Proverbs 24:16. The time for repentance and forgiveness is right now. The real danger in calamity which Jesus points out is that an unexpected disaster or a sudden death does not give us time to repent of our sins by acknowledging our wrongdoings and asking for pardon here and now before we die and are brought face to face with the Lord of heaven and earth when he calls us to his judgment seat. The book of Job reminds us that misfortune and calamity can befall both the righteous and the unrighteous alike. Jesus gives us a clear warning. Take responsibility for your actions and moral choices and put sin to death today before it can poison your heart, corrupt your mind, and bring destruction to your body as well. Allowing sin and sinful attitudes to go unchecked in us is like a cancer which spreads and corrupts us from within and causes death if it is not cut off. We must honestly and humbly acknowledge our sins before God and ask for His forgiveness and for His healing grace to restore and change us so that we may grow day by day into the holiness He desires for us. Holding on to sinful attitudes and refusing to confess our wrongdoing, sins, before God to receive His pardon and healing can only lead to one result, a corrupt heart, mind, and soul that is dead spiritually. Paul the Apostle reminds us that the wages of sin in death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord Romans 6 23
Spiritual death and separation from God is a far worse condition than any physical harm or loss we might experience in this present life. Choose today for the abundant life and grace which Christ has won for you through His victory over sin and death on the cross. The Sign of the Barren Fig Tree Jesus followed his warning to turning away from sin and not allow it to corrupt your minds and heart with an illustration and story, parable, from nature and farming which his listeners would have easily understood. Good land for growing crops and fruit trees were sparse in the arid climate of Judea and the surrounding desert region. One very common and important source of food for the people who lived in the region of Galilee and Judea was the fig tree. Its fruit was highly prized and became a symbol of God's fruitful blessing and provision for His people. A fig tree normally matured within three years, producing plentiful fruit. If it failed, it was cut down to make room for more healthy trees. A decaying fig tree and its bad fruit came to symbolize for the Jews the consequence of spiritual corruption caused by evil deeds and unrepentant sin. The unfruitful fig tree symbolized the outcome of Israel's indifference and lack of response to God's word of repentance and restoration. The prophets depicted the desolation and calamity of Israel's fall and ruin due to her unfaithfulness to God as the languishing Fig tree, Joel 1 7, Habakkuk 3 17, and Jeremiah 8 13. Jeremiah likened good and evil rulers and members of Israel with figs that were either good for eating or rotten and wasteful. Jeremiah 24 2. Jesus' parable depicts the patience of God, but it also contains a warning that we should not presume upon God's patience and mercy. God's judgment will come in due course, very soon or later. Jesus' parable of the barren fig tree illustrates his warning about the consequences of allowing sin, wrongdoing, and moral corruption to take root in our hearts and minds. We must turn away from sinful attitudes and sinful habits and turn to God for His transforming grace and power to change us. Why God Judges Why does God judge His people? He judges to purify and cleanse us of all sin so that we might grow in His holiness and righteousness, be in a right relationship with God. And He disciplines us for our own good to inspire a godly fear and reverence for Him and His holy word. God is patient. But for those who persistently and stubbornly rebel against Him and refuse to repent and change their course, there is the consequence that they will lose both their soul and body to hell. Are God's judgments unjust or unloving? When God's judgments are revealed in the earth, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. Isaiah 26, 9. To pronounce God's judgment on sin is much less harsh than what will happen if those who sin are not warned to repent and turn back to God. Don't tolerate sin. God in His mercy gives us time to get right with Him, but that time is now. We must not assume that there is no hurry. A sudden An unexpected death leaves one no time to prepare to settle one's account when he or she must stand before the Lord on the day of judgment. Jesus warns us that we must be ready at all times. Tolerating sinful habits and excusing unrepentant sin and wrongdoing will result in bad fruit, painful discipline, and spiritual disease that leads to death and destruction. The Lord, in His mercy, gives us both grace, His gracious help and healing, and time to turn away from sin. But that time is right now. If we delay even for a day, we may discover that grace has passed us by, and our time is up. 
Do you hunger for the Lord's righteousness, moral goodness, and holiness? Lord Jesus, increase my hunger for you, that I may grow in righteousness and holiness. May I not squander the grace of the present moment to say yes to you and your will and plan for my life. Amen. Further Reflection A Condemned Building Quote, There is no condemnation now for those who are in Christ Jesus. Unquote. Romans 8, 1 We often feel condemned or about to be condemned. In these moments we feel as if people are judging us, because they are. We are afraid of not being accepted and even rejected. We know that people's love for us is conditional, and sooner or later we won't meet their conditions. We have the haunting fear we will be condemned not only in this life, but for all eternity. The good news is, there is no condemnation now for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 1 Even if a mother should forsake her child, our Heavenly Father will never forsake us. Isaiah 49, 15 Jesus will never reject anyone who comes to Him. John 6, 37 As He did for the adulteress, Jesus will disperse the crowd condemning us. He will ask, Where did they all disappear to? Has no one condemned you? John 8, 10 He will say, Nor do I condemn you. John 8, 11 I will never desert you, nor will I forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5 Jesus' love is unchangeable and unconditional. Only in Him can we have absolute security. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. John 3.17 Our Prayer Jesus, people are picking up stones to throw at me. Protect me by surrounding me with your love. God's promise to us. Sir, leave it another year while I hoe around it and manure it. Then perhaps it will bear fruit. Luke 13.8 Thomas A. Kempis quote from The Imitation of Christ Ask not that which is pleasant and convenient, but that which is acceptable to me and for my honor. For if thou judgest rightly, thou oughtest to prefer and to follow my appointment rather than thine own desire or any other desirable thing. We are God's hands, feet, and voice. May His peace rest upon you as you go and announce the gospel of the Lord in your words and deeds. Thank you for joining today. Abundant blessings upon you and yours. Amen. We close as always in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>